Well, welcome in the precious and glorious name of Jesus to the Ignited Mentoring Series. My name is Robert Pears. Maybe you're one of those people that I talk to that you're in a very, very difficult season in life. It can be caused by a number of things, marital issues, family issues, health, but it's the most difficult, hardest season of your life. And you know, the answer is to get into the secret place. But as hard as you try, it seems so difficult. It seems so hard. So I want to share a message with you, a message that I've had to preach to myself and live out, but a message that works. And I'm going to share insight from Smith Wigglesworth on how to truly draw nigh to the Lord in the secret place in the most difficult season of your life. You will find that when you do, the blessing that God so imparts to you goes beyond. It's not just about you, but God wants to reach those around you. He wants to touch so many lives. So let's pray. Let's press in and get ready to receive a really powerful message. Father, we come in the name that is above all names, the name of Jesus. And we thank you that you would give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and a hearing heart. Mighty Holy Spirit, open the word and speak to us. And let us, Father God, truly have a greater hunger for your word, a greater capacity to hold on to your word. And let us be so filled so that we overflow rivers of living water pouring out from us. So change us, Father. Father, we come and we cling today and we refuse to leave until you bless us and we leave changed. I thank you that not one person listening, Father, would lead the same, but they really would know that they have touched the hem of your garment and there's an unction that's flowed out from you and has really made them whole. And we thank you, Father, in the name that is above all names, the name of Jesus, we pray. And everyone said, Amen. Well, I'm glad you're joining me here in my office. We're working on a lot of things, but this is such a great message. And I want to start in book, uh, sorry, the book of Hebrews, chapter 11. And in it, we see in verse 1, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, for by it the elders obtained a good report. Through faith, we understand the worlds were framed by the Word of God, so that things which are seen were made of things which do not appear. And then in verse 6, But without faith, it's impossible to please God. For he who comes to God must first believe that He is, and that He is the rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. A lot in these verses. Uh, if you continue on, you look at the stories of many great heroes of faith, who by faith, we can think of Enoch, and we just did a wonderful message on Enoch, and how he walked with God, how he so pursued the Lord, that relationship growing in intensity, but it was by faith, and it says by faith he was taken and was not. But here we understand that, that faith acts upon a hope, and there has to be a hope in us. We need a bigger vision of the Lord our God, and we need understanding who God is. I want to start by bringing up this wonderful Greek word, and it's regarding sacrifice. And we're going to touch on that. We need to share something first from Smith Wigglesworth. Now, beloved, if we're going to go and make any progress in divine life, we must have a real foundation. And there's no foundation, only the foundation of faith for us. If you're on the rock, no powers can move you, and there's no establishment for you outside of God's Word. Everything else is sand. And if you build on anything else but the Word of God, on imaginations, sentimentality, or any feelings, or any special joy, 
it will mean nothing. You must have a foundation, and that foundation will have to be the Word of God. And it's in those hard seasons where our foundation is exposed. What we really lean on, trust on. You know, those hard seasons when you're going through it, and you want so much to be heard, you want to feel like you're going to get justice, you want to know the truth, you want things to change. And often we are so moved naturally, it's like our natural senses become highlighted, heightened. And how do I come to the place where I can so walk by faith? In this hour where everything that I once believed seems to have crumbled. I'm reminded of Abraham who hoped against hope. And that's how I feel. That hope that I once had has so faded. But God wants to bring you to this place where you have a hope that's not built naturally. And you're not looking to things naturally. So that He brings you now to this place where you stand secure, kept. So that no matter what storm comes, no matter what attempt the enemy plays to get you emotionally caught, he fails. And you're able finally to enjoy life. How many of us, as we're going through these wilderness and difficult seasons, truly enjoy life? It's so hard. It's so difficult. And we're so caught by the storm. That's all we can see. As I said, I want to bring up this word sacrifice. Because in Hebrew, it comes from a word korban. And it has roots. You know, the Hebrew language is such a wonderful language. And it has roots. So they're root words. And when we look at the roots... It means to draw nigh. It means to come close to. And it talks about letting go of something that you treasure because you want to draw close to something or someone that you treasure even more. And we look at the word and we're told that God so loved the whole world that he gave his son as a sacrifice. I've shared before the story of my son, Stephen, who was born with half a heart. And they had to put him in ICU. And in the ICU, there was no, no stimulation allowed. We couldn't talk. We couldn't in any way touch him. And there I saw my son suffering. He would have up to 10 IVs into him. It is horrendous as a parent, as a father, to watch your child go through that. And I sat there broken. And the Lord said to me, this is what it's like for me. Because I could not give any stimulation to my son, even let him know I am here for you. And I understood that anything I did would bring death. I also understood the only way that we're ever going to connect would be through death. And in the midst of that, I understood what the Lord was saying. That Jesus, the Lord our God, stood there looking at us. And He wants you to know how much He loves you. See, in a relationship, how do we know someone loves us? There has to be communication. There has to be something. Smith said, may the Lord give us a new vision of himself, fresh touches of divine life, and of his presence that will shake off all that remains of the old life and bring us fully into the newness of life. May he reveal to us the greatness of his will concerning us. For there's no one who loves us like him. Yes, beloved, there's no love like his, no compassion like his. He is filled with compassion and never fails to take those who fully obey Him into that promised land, that place where you're so kept, cushioned, enveloped by that perfect love. And He wants you to know that He's sent you that word, which is His love letter, where He's constantly trying to reach you, communicate to you, that He's seeking everything. He's draw, He has taken so much action to draw nigh to you. He's saying, now will you draw nigh unto me? Because if you will, I will even come closer to you. And that's the cry of his heart. Because in the midst of the storm, that's what we so desperately need, is to draw nigh to him and have such an encounter where we're wrecked by that love, where that love penetrates every part, drips into every crevice of our heart, melts it, molds it, and makes it, softens 
so that all the hardness that's caused by the hurts and the injuries is finally gone. And we're a new person. Having put off the old, we have put on the new. Smith said, through sanctification of the Spirit, according to the election, you will get to a place where you are not disturbed. There's peace and sanctification of the Spirit because it is a place of revelation, taking you into heavenly places. It has been a place where God comes and speaks and makes Himself known to you. And when you are face to face with God, you get a peace which passeth all understanding, lifting you up from the state to a state on an inexpressible wonderment. It is really wonderful. And God wants to so meet with you. Sadly, most of us are not willing to so pay the price. We give more time and attention to the problem. I've been there where the desperation to know the truth, to feel justice, to feel like that person might repent, to feel that person might understood the wrong they did and want to put it right, that I was consumed with that. Every action that I did was motivated by that goal. But as I sat there one day before the Lord, finally surrendering, because this is where the word sacrifice truly comes in, that sacrifice of what was most important to me. And I had to realize that I had made lords of so many things, built up high places to the wrong things, and I had to place it all at the altar and give it to Him and surrender it to Him, knowing that He would meet me. Excuse me, my nose is very itchy. We want to draw near, but in the drawing near is this wonderful word, sacrifice. Now, we want to put on sacrifices that we want. We may give offerings to do things. But it's a sacrifice that pleases Him, that touches His heart. The sacrifice where we bring that which is really of the greatest value and treasure in our life at that moment and place it on the altar to show Him, God, You are more important to me. Where we will cling into the night. I would ask you, how many of us have taken that time when no one's around, in the time where we're alone at night, just to seek His face, not to be entertained, but God, I've got to have you. I've got to know you. There is a real pursuit of you that's not satisfied in a five-minute fix. Because the only one who will satisfy, the only one who will heal is Him. Remember we said there in the book of Hebrews, we come believing that He is. Who is he? Do you remember he asked his disciples, who do you say that I am? And I believe the master turns up and asks us the same thing, especially in those hard places. Who do you say I am? Smith went on to say, it is in the hard places where we see no help. We cry out to God. He delivers us. What for? To the end that we secure the tempted. It was said of Jesus that he was in all points tempted as we are. Where did he receive strength to comfort us? It was at the end of strong crying and tears when the angels came and ministered just in time and saved him from death just at the end. Is he not able? Oh, God highly exalted him. Now he can send angels to us. When? Just when we should go right down. Did he not stretch out his helping hand to us? You know, it's in that moment of just desperation where we've come to such an end where it looks like, God, I'm about to actually go under. And we need to so remind ourselves of how God never failed us once. We forget so easily, especially when we're in a storm and the storm is so loud. And we've got to go back. And I, I sometimes I find myself at, and those difficult seasons having to keep getting up in the middle of the night just to get with Him, to go after Him. Because I absolutely need to make connection. And until I know I'm satisfied, until I know that I walk away walking differently and I've been blessed. See, Jacob didn't quit until he got the blessing. Don't quit. Don't quit until you are changed and you get the blessing. I said to you, 
regarding who do you say I am. Until we get the revelation that He is the answer to whatever we're facing, the healer, the Lord of our breakthrough, the Lord our provider. And so we know and we stand fully persuaded, unshaken, it's resolved. And we're able to come believing that He is the rewarder. That I come to you, God, because you are my answer. I think about the question, who do you say I am? And the very question is the answer. You are the great I am. You are the almighty God. You are everything I need. If that's the case, then you pursue Him. You have to connect with Him. Trusting in faith that, as He said, if I draw nigh to you, you will draw nigh to me. Because I already seen the word, how far you've come to reach me. You can turn and say, but I'm so disqualified. You can look at all your sins and everything else, and you can miss the sacrifice and the blood, the price that Jesus paid. I'm not worthy, and I get that. But I'm so grateful for the blood. I honor it. And I tell the Lord, I come in just honoring the blood of Jesus. I stand guilty, but thank God for the blood. And I do not in any way want to grieve Him. I so honor that wonderful gift that He gave me. The gift of righteousness. To be clean with Him. Let me quote here from Hebrews chapter 5, verse 7, that Smith was referring to. Who, in the days of His flesh, when he offered up prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death and who was heard because of his godly fear. Though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things he suffered. And having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him, called by God as his high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Receiving the offerings, receiving the sacrifices. He's the one we bring it to. And he understands. He's been tempted in all ways. He went through it. He was, think about, he suffered in the proving of a son. And it's in that moment as we press through in that suffering where we surrender it to him and not allow that storm and that suffering to get in us. It may kill the flesh, but my spirit, man, is meant to be so filled with the life found in him that I stand secure in Him, that I cry out to Him. It's in those difficult times you'll find that God so draws close and wants to meet with you. Smith said, It is God who seeth into the deeps of the human heart. He seeth and saveth such in trouble. There is in a plan a purpose for others. How it is worked out? On the time of submission and yielding and yielding to the unfolding of God's plan, then we shall all be able to save others. See, God wants to launch you in. And so often as we go through that, it is that test that God wants to so promote you and to bring you into something greater. And that test stands before us. A test that He is so committed to abiding in us and with us to enable us to overcome, not on our strength, but His, if we'll cling to Him. Because there is a strengthening found in the clinging in the yielding, in the giving. And sometimes, like Jesus, we have to cry out. Listen, a real sacrifice is the giving over. Not a crying in self-pity and declaring, God, I'm a victim, and demanding justice and all of those things, but a crying out in the surrendering, in the giving, in the yielding, in the casting off. God, this has so helped me. This has defined me for so long, but I give it and I lay it at the altar. Recognizing, realizing that on this earth, I may never see justice. I may never have that person apologize, repent. Things may never be put right on this earth. But the most important thing is you. Because in you, I have a future and a hope. In you, there's something greater. In you, there's a blessing that's depressed on, shaken together, overflowing. That you have something greater and bigger and planned for me. So I come to you, and in this case, I give it to you. This is the best offering I can give. It's everything. It's my heart. It's my life. It's my hope. It's my future. And I place it on the altar, and I choose your will. I choose your way. I choose obedience. Obedience is such a powerful sacrifice. The giving over. 
the choosing, say, God, I not alone choose your will, I delight because your way, your will is so great. And you want us to know the length, the height, the depth, the width of your love, of how perfect the plan you have because you know us. Smith said this, God takes us to a place of need. And before you are hardly aware of it, you are full of consolation towards the needy. How? The sufferings of Christ abound in the ministry of spirit abound so often. It's a great blessing. We do not know our vocation in the spirit. It is so much greater than our appreciation of it. Then a word in season here and there in ministry, a sowing besides all waters as the Holy Spirit directeth our path. And there's such a place where all of a sudden that love that is so trickled into the heart, the process that takes time. See, we were injured and that injury was a process of time compounded by various things and events that God wants to now slowly strip from us, melt that he might mold. And as he works in the heart and changes it, the thing that happens is we become wrecked by that very love, the love demonstrated on the cross that we might know it. When you really know it, you become broken for the very ones who offended, hurt, and persecute you. And instead of demanding God, Deal with them. God, you need to put vengeance on them. You know, you have to judge them. All the things we desire. We're like, God, have mercy on them. We become broken behind the scenes, crying out, seeking the face of God for the very ones who are our enemies. The very ones that did so much damage, that have stood in their way, resisted us, created so many problems. We're broken because of that love. Because of the love that now defines us, makes us. A love that's changing us. And because we're so secure in that love, that we're able to love. Because before we were insecure in brokenness, needing, always needing and never satisfied. But in this wonderful place, I stand secure, complete, whole. So that no matter what, they can do whatever they want. No longer are they able to get in and press buttons and cause a response. Rather, because behind the scenes I'm crying out for mercy, there's such a wall keeping me. And I'm praying for the greatest vengeance ever. Because I recognize the true enemy is not them, but the enemy behind them, the devil. And to see that life wrecked for Jesus by the same love that's wrecked me, that my life now might become a living epistle. See, often in the midst of the storm, the thing we don't see is the lives around us. Those, as we are broken and injured, that we break and hurt, that we damage our children, our families. Now seeing a life wrecked by the very love of God, that it does something in them. They see a living epistle. They see how the Holy Spirit's come and in the tenderness, the vulnerability, touches our very heart. And as he writes the law of the Spirit on it, he imparts the very nature of the Father, and we become like him. Smith said, God has a great purpose for us, that we might be in the world with some salt to save the people who need seasoning, and with the light to bring revelation of Christ, with an intensity that should make the people see truly he was the Son of God. And then, the divine position of an epistle of Christ, wherever we should preach the truth, Christ in us the hope, the evidence of the eternal purposes of God. We live in a hardened generation. They are, if we think about an you know, instant resistant, we have a, a generation resistant to the gospel because they've seen the fake. But when they see the real, when they see someone that's preached the word to themselves, broken by the very love of God, radically changed by a radical love, so that they now radically love. They recognize that you didn't do it by yourself. There was something bigger. And they see that love, a real love. And it begins to do something in them. It begins to sow seed and water and wonderfully bring forth a harvest.
so that we rise and shine. We're true lights in this hour, living epistles. Let me finish with this. As you think about the hard season that you're in, why it's so worth giving the time, crying out to God those nights, seeking His face. When no one's around and there's so many things you could do, you seek His face and you can just give it all over. The baptism tears, the crying out, the surrendering, bring it as a sacrifice and laying at His feet. Because when you give it as a sacrifice, you leave it. You walk away. It is His and it's no longer yours. And it's a worship. And I want my whole life to worship Him. So Smith said this, two things will get you to leap out of yourself into the great promises of God today. One is purity, and the other is faith, which is kindled more and more by purity. I believe the Lord wishes you to have such an inheritance in the kingdom of the saints in light, that you'll be a heritage in your own land, that all the people may know that you've lived in such divine purpose for God. They are quickened by your ministry and your face has been an inspiration. The shake of your hand has helped them forward and your smile has won them affection. That you do something, you carry something, something you can't fabricate, something you cannot manufacture, something that's real and you know it. You look back and you now stand with a great joy saying, God, you changed me. Whether anybody else sees it or not, I know it. It will stir a faith in you and an excitement in you. And I'm telling you, as you stand there in that place of persecution, they're watching you. They're listening to you. And now for the first time, you're preaching something real. Maybe you tried to preach the gospel with that religious zeal and it didn't work. It caused them to run from you and to run from Jesus. But now you're being real because there's a real love that's wrecked you in the most difficult season of your life and has brought you out and is now bringing you in. And that's what God wants. And I just pray that in the name of Jesus, that you would so press forward, that you would not quit, but a hunger, that God would increase your capacity for more of Him, increase your desperation, that in the hard places you stop looking at the things, at the natural, but you would dare linger. You would dare pay whatever price is necessary, God, to, that I might get time with you. And I'll keep going. Trusting by faith, not by feelings anymore. Not moved by my memories, my hurts, my opinions, or anything of the soul arena. But by faith, trusting simply in your word. That if I draw nigh to you, you'll draw nigh to me. And I give this sacrifice in faith. Because my expectation, based on your word, is you will meet with me. Just as Enoch had such an expectation, God, I want more of you, that every day he pressed in until God finally had to take him home. Take him with him. And I pray that your desire will be, God, I want to be so with you. I want to draw closer to you than I've ever, ever been. That every day, you start a new walk, and that new walk is what you are defined by. Not by the hurt, not by the injury, not by the bitterness. But the new walk is seen in how you talk, how you actually physically walk, what you do, and how you do it. Your pursuit, your new goals. And that you now live no longer for yourself, because you're blessed to be a blessing. I really pray this message has encouraged and strengthened you. And we start this new series of just looking afresh at the secret place. That you would look and check the videos out and they would just strengthen you in this hour. In this critical hour to live boldly for Jesus. Locked in that place. Kept by Him. And you do not allow the wrong voice to come in to deceive, mislead. But you build that relationship that's sure, solid, secure. That you're not moved and built upon a man, because men will fail, but he will not. Amen? So I just want to bless you. I want to encourage you, and I just ask in the name of Jesus, if this message blessed you, would you please like, share, subscribe, and give your comments. Because as you do, you really do help us with the algorithms at YouTube and Google, and I thank you. And I also would ask, would you consider becoming a partner with us? 
We're daring to believe God for bigger things. I believe God always wants us to ask for more, and we're standing for more than ever in this year. And I need prayer partners to stand with us, whether officially or not. For more information, simply go to robertpairs.org and you can sign up um, on the partner page to become an official partner. And you will receive our email newsletter. You get invited to our Zoom services, whether you want to join them or not. Uh, we do at least once a month on our Tuesday, have a time of prayer and praying for the sick. So if you need healing, that's a good time to join. And if God puts in your heart, would you consider becoming a financial partner? We need those two. And together we can really do something. And you know what? As we press forward and you see the results, you share in the rewards. And we'll stand one day before the Lord together as partners sharing in those rewards. And I thank you so much. So I bless you. And I remind you as always that this is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it because through and for him. In that name that is above all names, the name of Jesus, we pray. And everyone said, Amen and Amen. Thank you.